Welcome to Hope Unveiled, the podcast that guides you on a transformative journey toward a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We are Sunrise Church of Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, and our mission is to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those who may feel far from God. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the teachings of Jesus, offering practical insights and guidance for your faith journey. Whether you're taking your first steps in faith or seeking to deepen your existing relationship with Christ, we invite you to join us on this journey to embrace the hope that transforms lives. Uh, My name is Pastor Chris. If I haven't met you, welcome to Sunrise Church. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're taking part in what's happening. Um, You know, it is cold out, but Sherry and I just spent two and a half days in Calgary. By the grace of God, our flights left Vancouver, got into Calgary, and left on time, and we're back. Or else you'd be watching me on video, just an iPhone video, like live to the service. So we were there for a memorial service for a guy named Ken Parker. He's been a part of our network of churches and fellowship of our churches. How many, by just show of hands, you know or you've met Ken Parker along the way? Okay, a good number of you know or met him. Uh, I was really inspired. Uh, Ken lived an amazing life, and it was just great to celebrate with, with some of his friends and family and our ACOP colleagues Uh, Ken has had a ministry of the prophetic, and what's the prophetic is really uh, hearing the thoughts of Jesus and conveying them to other people. Uh, Ken ministered in our church a number of times and was very close to Sherry, and I really was a a support and a cheerleader. And I want to share with you two words that he gave um, uh, six and a half and five and a half years ago to our church so that you can see how prophetic gets fulfilled in churches. Does that sound cool? Okay. Me and Jock? All right. We'll do that. And Jen? Okay, let's do this. October 1st, 2017. Okay, hands up if you were a part of our church in 2017. Just look around. Okay, here's the word. He said, I was in the word this morning and I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying something to do with the nations. This is the summary form. He read Isaiah 55, 5. You will also command nations that you do not know and peoples unknown to you will come running to obey because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. Now pause. This is the same scripture that God gave my wife, Sherry, Pastor Sherry, 10 years ago, almost to this day now, before we even moved here. Ken didn't know that. Ken reads the scripture. And he says, I saw what the Lord was doing. He was giving you keys for the nations. I didn't see him giving you all the keys at once, one at a time, and the Spirit was going to say he was going to bring people into you, give you connection. They will come in your door, and there'll be a relationship developed. God will give you a burden for them. And he actually spoke, in the, the full prophetic word, he spoke different than the nations we were already involved in, which were at that time Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe. Those were the main nations we were involved in. He will give you a burden. God will give you the keys for connections. First of all, for reaching people within your own community of whatever ethnic background. Then those people groups will be given strategies because they have the keys on how to unlock and reach that people group within the region. And he said, I hear the Lord saying, particular to the leadership, be keenly aware of those I bring in from other nations. Be listening to my spirit for those I put my finger on now. I'm giving you the key to this one. Then take that one right now. The nations you have not known, he will give you favor and grace. Step into this plan, he said. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. That's, that's Ken, Ken and Linda. If you came from another nation since 2017, I want you to stand. If you came from another nation since 2017, I want you to stand. And you're part of our church now. Yeah. Keep standing. No, just stay standing, please. Okay, don't be shy, y'all. Don't make me look at you Filipinos. Y'all should be standing. Okay? Okay. Don't make me look at you Vietnamese people, you Chinese people. Don't make me look at you. I don't see all you Filipinos standing. Come on now. Can I just read the nations? When when we got here, there were three nations represented. Three. There was a little Zambian named Flora. There was Esther from Kenya. And then later came Pastor Shem from Sri Lanka. Koreans, Philippines, China, Burkina Faso, Democratic Republic of Congo. Come on, where are Congolese people? Jacques Way, aren't you standing? You should be standing. Come on now. Come on now. Ethiopia, Eritrea, Kenya. Come on, Kenya. Nigeria, anyone? There we go. Loud and proud. 
Mozambique, Malawi, South Africa. Let's hear ya. Hey. Come on, you guys love that bell tongue, don't you? Come on now. Uganda, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Burundi, Tanzania, Rwanda, Namibia, Senegal. I don't even know this one. Conga, Kishasa. Mexico, Brazil, our neighbors to the south in Merca, the United Kingdom, India, and Australia. That's 27 nations. Come on, just praise God for that. You can be seated. That just shows how God will fulfill his word. And, and the test of someone, if they're a prophet, not just do they have a good and inspiring word, but is it fulfilled? And can it be fulfilled? So I'll just remind you again, 10 years ago, almost to the day, my wife heard Isaiah 55, 5. We started praying that for our church. Pastor Ken Parker, three and a half years after we arrived, starts prophesying that into our church. We were already starting to pray for the nations, but then 27 nations. So 24 were added to this church. That's amazing. Let's thank God one more time. And then a year later, we had Pastor Ken in. And he said, I was praying for your church and what the Lord might have. And he, the Lord dropped something into his spirit. He saw two rivers. One rep, these rivers represented the church. The first river was an apostolic river that was militant and warring. The second river was a shepherding river that was peace and calm. It looked like his rest. And he saw these two ridges converging. And to give you the summary of the word, he watched these rivers come together, the two colors, and they were kind of trying to mess. If you ever, mesh, if you ever seen where rivers come together, you can see actually the different colors of the headwaters where they come together. And it was looking messy. But as the rivers moved further down, and as the leaders submitted to the will of God in the convergence of the two rivers, as the rivers flow further down, you can no longer see a distinction of the colors. There's a blending of the two. There's great power in what they're able to accomplish. And let me illustrate this. The apostle and the apostolic gifting always wants to see the church moving forward. They want to see the church on mission. They want to see the church moving forward. The pastoral wants to care and make sure people are, are, are shepherded well and cared for well and heard well. These two things need to work in concert. That's why he saw these two rivers. There's a blending and great power as they flow together. And they figured out how to connect with one another. The piece I saw was that neither river was supposed to lose its identity. Both rivers have a very valid place in this church. And hear this. Both of those rivers are going to provide healing for the nation. And, sorry, healing for the region. Do we need healing in our region? Amen. We do. The apostolic and the pastoral. And then, and then he started to kind of give a bit more context to the word. And he, he said, he said, there were times when I see that even in your meetings and in your worship, there will be like a gentle pastoral note. And some of the people who are more like apostolic are kind of going, well, well what's this about? And he gave us a challenge, and he said, it, you have to see what the Spirit is doing. And if, and if you're an apostolic-style person, and it's a very pastoral tone in the worship, you need to get into it, he said. And he said, likewise, the people who are, are more pastoral, they might hear a more strong, warring type of militant song, and they might go, ah, this isn't my thing. And he said, you need to get into this, because both of these rivers come together. They have an amazing force. And I've been seeing this walked out in our church. Can we say amen to the Word of God? Amen. amen. Yeah, let's thank God. That's good. That's good. I think there's great things that God is doing, great things he's stirring. And uh, it's really up to us to be responsive and, and really follow in that thing. We believe that God is still speaking. And he points people to not only speak within the church, but he points people to speak kind of over churches. And that's really what we see here. Uh, now, last week, we had a great service. Uh, how many of you were here last week? Th throw your hands up. Okay. Someone say amen if you are here last week. Uh, last week, we want to touch on a couple things. We talked about this series that we're in called Values. And we're trying to talk about the biblical values, the, the biblical things that undergird our church, that shape the culture of our church, and shape our behaviors. And last week, we talked about this idea of living expectantly in faith. And I asked you if you had chair faith or prayer faith. Do you have chair faith in the fact that you just passively sit in a chair and you exert faith on it because you just hope it's going to stand up? Or do you have prayer faith, which is like Ephesians 3.20, where it says, our God can do more than we ask or imagine. And then I said also, one of the things we want to do, if we live expectantly in faith, we don't want to want to profess things in faith, but we want to believe expectantly that something's going to happen. So when you pray for someone, you actually believe something is going to happen, whether it's a healing or breaking of addiction or it's provision for a job or something with their kids. You believe something is going to happen and you're confident of that very thing. And we also talked that, that faith was like a muscle. 
How many remember that? Let's see. Oh, there it is. Faith grows as it's work. That's Boyko going up against Jonathan. Now, just quick. Hold on. Sean Gore, are you here today? Ooh, you, coach, you got off easy. Sean Gore was going to take you up on a challenge this week, so he's not here. Sean Gore, former BC Lion receiver. Coach Boyko, former strength and conditioning coach of the BC Lions. That would have been a good head to head. I would have liked to see that. What's that? <laughs> you know his weaknesses are. Right. The next time Sean's in church, it's on. All right. So let me talk to you about values for a second. We believe that values undergird what we do. They're, they're biblical and they inform our behaviors and our culture. But there's a difference between holding a value and practicing a value. Are you with me? There's a difference between holding something and say, I value this, and then practicing that very value. Now, let me just give you an example of some values. Uh, if you have a family, sometimes we have a value of connection that we want to connect with them. But then we do something like have a meal, and what's on the table with us is our phone. And it actually is contrary to the value. So you have your phone on your table. It just tells people that this is more important than what I'm doing. So you're holding a value of connection, but the value you're practicing is I just want to be in communication with everyone else except who's here. And, and sometimes people say, oh, just, just flip your phone over. No, just leave your phone somewhere else. Like put it in a bag, hide it away. Um, sometimes people, they'll call me or they text me like, hey, you didn't get my text. I'm like, yeah, I'm not paying attention to my phone. It's not like I just have this thing grafted onto my head. Like I just... <laughs> Number two, maybe you have a value in your life for fitness that, you know, it's the new year. You want to get fit and you just, you're ready. But the only problem is, even when it's minus a bazillion, you still want to eat ice cream all the time. Or you're like, Red Robin, I got a gift certificate. I'm going. I just can't turn down those bottomless fries. You're holding the value of fitness, but the value you're practicing is not in alignment with it. Okay? Here's one that can, this might hit a little more close to home. Maybe you have a value that you want to build community and have friends. Okay? but you've never practiced reaching out to someone or inviting them out or inviting them into your house. Okay? I, I have friends um, that I think they're my friends, but then I go back and I realize we're not actually talking. We're not texting. We're not FaceTiming. And I'm thinking, okay, are we really friends? Are we, actually, are we actually doing this thing called friends? If you want community, that means your practice needs to be texting, talking, and getting together with people. Okay? That's one. Now, let's talk about in the church. We can value the Holy Spirit and his gifts, but we might be in a place where we don't practice them. Now, when I was first in this church, I realized that some of our, or the teaching we had even kind of undergirding some of the stuff, we really didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. It became really clear to me when I sat in a baptismal class and I asked this large baptismal class, we're teaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're teaching about the baptism of water. I said, how many of you heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And these people have been in their church a long time. And in this class that I was teaching, no one put up their hands. And some of these people had been in our church for years and years and years. I'm like, well, that's, that's not good. That means we're not actually practicing the value of the Holy Spirit. So this morning in service, how do we practice the value of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Jose comes with a message. Gerald comes with a message. We want to respond to those things. So if we want to value the Holy Spirit, we need to practice those things. Are you with me? If we want to be a church that values the next generation, then we need to practice it. So years ago, we said, we're going to put an emphasis on the next generation. We're going to value it. Well, what's the things we did? We started raising money and special offerings to do different things, to renovate our classrooms, to hire staff, to bring people on board. Like, that's what you do. So we value it, but lots of people say, well, I value that. But it's in the practice where it really matters. So today, we're talking about the value of sending people on mission to share the gospel. Sending people on mission to share the gospel. Now, the question I'm going to ask you in your personal life, do your values match your practice? Think about it. Do your values match your practice? In our church, we ask the same question. Do our values match our practice? Now, as we get into this today, uh, just, just hold on. Like, if you got a reservation for 1135 for lunch, just literally cancel it, okay? Sorry, just cancel it. And if you're, like, really hungry... You know, Jesus said he had, he had food that his disciples didn't know about. And it was the word of God. So you're getting fed by the word of God today, okay? So just buckle in. Don't look at the clock. If I see you doing this one, like, or, you, or this one, like, where you pull out your phone, and you're like, Check. Just, just don't, okay? We literally get, like, maybe two hours with you a week out of all the hours in a week. How many hours are in a week, by the way? How many knows that? Who knows? 
168. We're going to get, we're going to get two. That's not even a tithe. That's not even, that's bad. So just hang with us, okay? Here, I want to define a couple things today as we start, and then we're going to get into the scripture. We're going to talk about Jesus' mission. Here, here's a big definition for mission. What is the mission that the church is called to? The mission is this, the calling of every follower of Jesus to participate in his redemptive purposes. That's it. That's the big mission. The calling of every follower. Do you know it doesn't say some followers? It doesn't say good followers. It doesn't say holy followers. It says what? Every follower of Jesus to participate in his redemptive purposes. This is what your mission is. This is the big mission. Because God has put us on this earth, not just to take up space. You didn't come here just to take up a seat. And if you did, I pray today, you get woken up that you are more than just someone who's warming up a seat. That God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Now, at Sunrise Church, we have a mission that, that we have kind of specified. And we specified it with language that can translate to your neighbor really well. And it's this, is that we are called to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those far from God. Super easy. Why? Because when you meet someone who doesn't know Jesus and you need, you need something to say to pass on to them, if they're going to ask you, why do you even go to church? And you're like, oh, because uh, the Bible told me so. Well, they don't believe in the Bible. Don't even start there. Okay. But I know this. Many, many people want hope. Many, many people want purpose. You start using language that people can put their hands on and they can hold on to. What are we to do? We're to carry it. Why? Because we are the carriers of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to carry hope and purpose. I just encourage you, even this week, if you're brave enough and bold enough to ask someone, do you have enough hope in life? Let me say, do you have hope or not? No. Do you have enough hope in life? See what they say. And then let the Holy Spirit fill your mouth. See, we have an individual purpose. We have a shared purpose. We have a collective purpose as a church. This is our shared and collective purpose to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those far from God. Now, I just want to look with you at three purposes that we see in Jesus's life. Would you turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 19? We believe the Bible is authoritative. We believe it's infallible and it is the rule for all of us in Christian faith and character. It's divided into two parts, the Old Testament and New Testament, further into books chapters and verses, and we're going to be in chapter 19 of the book of Luke, which is the account of Jesus on the earth. And in this passage, chapter 10, Jesus has just met someone called Zacchaeus, a famous story that some of us learn in, in kids' church. He was a sinner. He was a tax collector. And after Jesus draws him in, he changes his whole life, and he repents, and he gives back. And it says this key, key verse for the mission of Jesus, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You know, I know some people who have said, and some theologians who even said, God is not active in his pursuit of people. <laughs> the problem is your voice gets really quiet when you compare it to the verse here. Because Jesus' purpose was to seek and save the lost. Hey, listen, if you're seeking something, are you going after it? Are you focused on it? Are you, are you changing your actions and your behaviors to get that very thing? Come on, pink Stanley water bottles, what's up with that? Come on, like, what, what's up with that? On eBay now for like $300? People were just going crazy for those pink Stanley Starbucks water bottles. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ask someone who's younger beside you and just, they'll tell you all about it. People were going after it wild. Like, it's crazy. Who got one, by the way? Just check. I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing. Someone's waiting for someone to put their hand up. But when you seek something, you go after it. Guess what? Jesus came to seek after those who are lost. That means that there's people who have been found and there's people who are lost. This is one of the primary missions of Jesus. Are you with me today? Turn with me to the next gospel, the gospel of John. In the gospel of John, we're going to read a little bit more about what Jesus was doing. John 14, we'll start in verse 8. Jesus is teaching his followers and speaking to his followers. And he says in verse 8, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would know the Father. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Then Philip, one of his disciples, his followers, said, Lord, show us the Father. And it is enough for us. And Jesus said, have I not been with you so long that you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Well, what is another part of Jesus' mission is to show us the Father and show us the way to the Father. That he is the way to connect with, know, and understand God because he is the representation of God. This is who Jesus is. This is what he's doing. So he's seeking and saving the lost. Then he's revealing the Father and showing the way to the Father. Then one of my personal favorites. Now, if you heard that word about apostolic and pastoral, you know where I, I tend to be. I'm far more apostolic than I am pastoral. And I'll tell you that because I don't want you to be disappointed in me if I'm not like super, super compassionate and super loving and I'm like driving the church to keep it on mission because that's my gifting. That's what I'm supposed to do. So don't expect me to be who I'm not, okay? And I won't expect you to be who you're not. But let's get into this one. Here's a beautiful one. 1 John 3, 8. This is talking about what's happening in the early church. And the apostle John is talking about uh, sin and he's talking about righteousness. And then he says this in verse 8 of 1 John 3. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Come on now. Come on now. Have you ever felt tempted in your life? Have you ever felt like the enemy wants to resist you? Come on, people. Are we alive today? Are we, are we awake? Okay, good, good. Just checking. Because I read this verse, and man, it encourages me because I think, like, he's here. He's not just here to be, like, just passive with me. He's not just, like, beside me and passive with me. He's literally out to destroy the works of the devil. This is what he's supposed to do. This is what he's doing. He's working at this. So when I feel, like, tempted, when I feel discouraged, when I feel like there's spiritual things going on around me, I remind myself, First John, 3.8 tells me, Jesus is here, the Son of Man, the Son of God is here to destroy the works of the evil one. Come on, let's stand on that, church. That's a good thing. Mission of Jesus, seek and save the lost. Show us the Father and show us the way to the Father and to help destroy the works of the evil one. Now, church, I'll say this. In our mission, he doesn't just want us to be good people. He doesn't just want us to do good works. He wants us to be a sent people that through the power of the Holy Spirit share the gospel with the nations. That's what he wants. Not just to be good people, not just to do good works, but a sent people empowered by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the nations. Turn with me as we go through the word today. We're going to have a lot of time in the word today. Turn all your alarms off, like I said earlier. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Now, the book of Corinthians was written to an early church uh, as they were being birthed and formed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to read a little bit. Paul, who is writing this letter, he says this, he says, The love of Christ, verse 14, controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Well, just hold, hold on. This, this is the precursor to where I'm going to go. It says this, that those who live, are you alive today? Might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Oh. This is the precursor to what we're going to just read next. I, I'm not living for myself. As much as I want to think I'm living for myself, he says, no, I'm living for the sake of the one who died for me and was raised. And then he says later in verse 17, going down, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Someone say amen. amen. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself giving us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, because of this very thing, because we don't live for ourselves, because we're made a new creation, 
Because Christ has reconciled the world, he's given us something. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Three times that term reconciliation is there. So it tells us this. Church, we're not supposed to live for ourselves. We're not supposed to live for ourselves. We're really supposed to live for others. And you've been made a new creation. Why? Just so you can prance around and look good as a Christian and say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm forgiven, I'm blessed. It's good. But so that you can take that ministry that he gave to you of reconciliation and you can take it to others. What is reconciliation? It's really simply this. Restoring harmony and unity between God and people. Simple. What is reconciliation? Restoring harmony and unity between God and people. That is part of our mission. That's part of our calling. I love that Jesus trusts us with this. Being sent means this. You're a new creation and you have a new ministry. Are you with me? You don't need to be a pastor, a worship leader, a missionary to have a ministry. Every person has been given a ministry tells us here we are all ambassadors. And I believe this, when you are radically transformed yourself by the power of Jesus Christ, you lead others to be transformed. When you've experienced his grace and his goodness and his changing in your life, you lead others to that same transformation. Are you with me? It's not just that he wants us only to be good people. No, he wants us to have good character. We want to represent Christ. He doesn't just want us to have good works but he wants us to be a sent people through the power of the Holy Spirit, sharing the gospel with the nations. That's what he wants for each of us. What is the good news? What is the gospel? We've been talking about this in, in the fall, and, and we're going to keep it before you because we really believe it's powerful. This is the gospel. This is the good news, is that through the love and work of Jesus, all those who were far off are brought near into his kingdom. That through repentance and faith, Jesus saves us into a new life. He forgives you and me of our sins. He heals us from our brokenness and he leads us by his spirit to follow him. That's the good news. So even to you today, if you feel like you're here and you know Jesus, you've been following him, but you feel far off, the good news is still good to you because it says, come near, come near. There's nothing that can hold you back. There's nothing that can hold you away. Good news needs to be good news in all situations and to all people. And I believe this, that as we learn to communicate the good news, we learn how to actually bring it to the context of the people we meet with. So think about the situations around you in your life. Is there someone you know who has grief and loss? Probably. Is there someone you know who's going through sickness? Is there someone you know who's got problems in their family or in their marriage? A lot of times as Christians, we don't always know what to say. So we say like, well, Jesus loves you and he died for you and he rose again for you. It's true, but it's not always the good news they need to hear. For someone who's walking in loss and grief, the good news is there's hope because Jesus is with you even in the valley. That's good news. For someone who's walking through strife in their family, the good news is that Jesus knows what family strife is like. And when we put our eyes on him, that's the focus. That's the good news. It doesn't mean, it doesn't take away from the power of the cross. No, but the good news someone needs to hear right in front of you. When you're sitting with a server at a restaurant and you're talking about their life, when you're talking to your coworker and they're talking about their life, what's the good news for them? There is hope, there is purpose. Are you with me this morning? You ready for another half an hour? There you go. Some of you are, some of you are, some of you aren't. You're like, I came to this church the first time the guy preached for like an hour. 168 hours a week. Give us two and I'm only getting a fraction, okay? I've got a water bottle. Don't make me use it. All right. Let's turn to the book of Romans. Romans is written to a group of people in the early church. And one of the most classic messages out of Romans comes in chapter 10. And it talks about those who are coming to know Jesus, who are professing faith. They're believing. They're confessing that, that he has risen again. But it says this, and I want to draw our attention to this very important passage because we're talking about sending people on mission to share the gospel. 
Chapter 10, verse 13, it says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Someone say amen to that. Amen. Come on now. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they had never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Church, people can call on the name of Jesus to be saved, but that's only if they've believed in that name. They can only believe in that name if they've heard of that name. They can only hear about that name if someone is preaching. They can only be preaching if someone has been sent. How important is it that people are sent? I'll ask you that again. How important is it that you are sent? Do you know, I, I will never brush shoulders with many of your coworkers, your neighbors, but that's the way God intended it because he planted you, Tom, right there. He planted you, Marilyn, right there. Amen. Val and Rob. Lito, he planted you right there. Quan, I, I probably will never meet your coworkers, but he planted you right there. He sent you right there. God is in the business of sending people on mission. He sent his very son into this world, and he says to you, I'm sending you into this world. You know what he even prays? He says, I, I pray you, I, that you don't take them out of the world. He prays that we'd be in the world. Now, I want to bring you a couple quotes because I love to bring some quotes. This one's been formative for my whole life, my whole philosophy around church. Christopher J.H. Wright said this, It's not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission. Okay, okay. what came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, the church or the mission? The mission came first. And God formed a church around the mission. Sometimes we think the purpose of the church is let's come together. Let's sing my favorite song. And if not, I'm going to be grumpy. And we're not going to sing the fourth stanza and clap. And I come together to hear an encouraging word where I'm not challenged at all, where I'm just affirmed and I'm told, you can do it. You have everything in you to do it. Yeah? That's not church, man. Church is about being on mission. It doesn't mean we, we don't spend time in the presence. No, we spend time in the presence because when you adore and you get face to face with Jesus, man, you're catapulted onto the mission because you've just had a, this love encounter with the God of the universe and you're like, I want to take that somewhere. So now we trade them off. It's all about mission. That's it. We're just military. We're like Salvation Army. Just go, go. No, it's not all about that. But it's, that's, the, that's the end point. Do you know the, 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 the one thing that continues? Well, there's a few things that continue when you get into heaven, worship continues in heaven. The connection with believers continues in heaven. The presence of God continues in heaven. Do you know the only thing that doesn't continue in heaven? The mission of God. Because the mission of God is for the earth. Caleb, Madhu, I love you, man. And I want to tell you that God sent you and put you on that campus at UBC. And I felt something in my heart for post-secondary students that are here today, those that are in college, university, Bible college, whatever, God has sent you to those places. Don't ever second guess what God is doing when he's put you in those places of learning because you will encounter all sorts of different things, but God puts you in those very places to make a difference, to be sent into that very place. Caleb, you're one of them making a difference. And people have come to Jesus because of your witness on that campus of UBC because you are a part of the church and God made the church for mission. Bonhoeffer said it this way. The church is only the church when it exists for others. Ooh, go on, think about that. If we exist for ourselves, it doesn't work, man. We just, all we're doing is having a Holy Ghost prayer party. No one cares. My neighbors couldn't care. Half my family wouldn't care. It's when we exist for others. The church, the ecclesia, means the assembly of the called out ones. Now, I have many friends who are workers 
around the world. We support workers around the world uh, and we just love sending people uh, on mission, not only here locally, but supporting by prayer and finances around the world. And it's just amazing to see what God's doing. But there's something that happens when, when a missionary or global worker gets sent onto another field. They literally, the first thing is they, they're injected into a foreign culture. Literally injected right into it. The second thing that happens is they realize that their beliefs as workers and missionaries are totally different than the majority. Totally different. So we have friends who are in uh, East Asia. We have friends who are in East Africa. Both populations of those uh, countries are overwhelmingly non-Christian. They're up against it when they try to bring the gospel into those countries. The third thing they do is they learn the culture and the language to relate to the people so that they can bring the gospel to the people. That's what they do. So a lot of our friends who are in these nations, they spend two years in language learning just with people, just building relationships with the people so they can relate to them. Then they do this thing, which I love. And you can use the word mine, or you can use the word excavate. Some people would want to use the word exegete because it's so theologically proper. They actually, they look in the culture for God's themes in the culture. So the, the culture, which has redemptive themes in it, they say, that's a God thing. That's a God thing. That's a God thing. And they begin showing the people where God's presence has already been there because they're looking for God's themes in culture. The last thing they do, they look for where God is working. They don't, they don't try to start something and say, God, where are you working? Show me where you're working. I'm going to join with that. When our missionaries uh, in the Middle East, uh, or sorry, in East Asia, realized that there was a backlog of, I think, something like 15,000 people who had reached out through different portals, some online, some through phone, to receive a Bible and meet a believer, that changed their mission. They didn't have to go look for people who wanted to encounter Jesus. They literally just had to chat with them. And people got saved and people got baptized. Churches were planted in remote areas. They look for God where God's working. Here's the challenge. We, a lot of the time as Christians, go, oh, that's so good. Praise those missionaries and those workers. Thank you, workers. But do you know it's the same for us? that you've been injected into a foreign culture, that your beliefs as a Christian do not match the majority. And generally we stop there. And we stop learning the culture and the language in order to relate and bring the gospel to them. That's what God's call is. Learn the culture, learn the language people talk about, and bring the gospel. Then we need to excavate, we need to exegete, we need to mine our culture for the God themes. You know, when I listen to like modern day, like pop music and stuff like that, some people just, they just, they hear it as like, oh, it's so sexualized and it's so just perverse and it's just demon music. Yeah, sure. But you know what I hear? Longing for connection. That is a God theme in our culture. People are longing for connection. People in Vancouver statistically have been some of the loneliest people in all of Canada. We might be friendly, but we're not hospitable. We don't go past the, hi, how are you doing? Oh, it's a nice dog. I love your dog. I got a dog too. Where do you get your dog groomed at? And then it's like, peace out, bye. We need to mind the culture here for the themes of God. And then we need to look for where he's working. This is how we become missionaries. You see, the early church, they were totally radical. I want to tell one story of the early church. Are you still with me today? Please. Thank you. Thank you. I just need two of you. I only need two. And those, those are our staff. <laughs> See, the early church was radical. Here's what happened in Acts 3 and 4. Jesus just sent the Holy Spirit. Everyone's baptized in the Holy Spirit and empowered. Peter and John go out. There's a guy at the gate, beautiful, going into the temple. And he is a beggar and he is lame. And they, they, they say, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have we give you. Rise up in the name of Jesus and walk. Guy gets up and walks. Miracle, amazing, powerful. Then all of a sudden, the next thing, they're before the rulers because the rulers are mad at them and they arrest them and they say, no more preaching in Jesus' name. <laughs> You've probably heard that before. No more preaching in Jesus' name. And then what happens? They start preaching back to them when they're told not to preach. They talk about their salvation in no other name. And they say, 
You cannot speak the name of Jesus. And then they answer them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you or to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Come on, church, we need that spirit in us. That we cannot help but speak of what we have seen and heard and what God is doing. Challenge to you today. Tell someone this week about the prophetic words that Ken Parker spoke and years later are fulfilled. Tell them, just watch their eyes go, what? Here's the way to start. Hey, have you ever been to a psychic? Ask them, here, just, you, you get where I'm going. Ask them, have you ever been to a psychic? Have you ever had your fortune told? Ask them that, why? That will create an open door into their understanding of culture, which they, that think, they think that's telling the future, and say, can I tell you a story? Guaranteed, they'll listen, especially if they've been involved in that. We had a person we know really close that said, hey, what do you think of like psychics and mediums? I said, well, I gotta tell you what, I think you know I'm a pastor, right? But it's an open door to talk about spiritual things. That's a challenge. We cannot but help speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. A lot of times, because our culture is so foreign to Jesus, they will not understand the Bible. They will not understand Jesus saves. And they surely do not understand sin. So we have to be wise to know where the starting point is with people. Ask the person that question. Have you ever, have you ever gone to a psychic? Have you ever gone to a medium? Is that, have you ever done? Can I tell you a story? I just heard this story. And you don't have to even say it's in church. You just... You can tell them. And then all of a sudden, it's opening. Okay? The church was radical. We cannot help but speak of what we have seen and heard. So what happens after they were told not to preach and not to speak and after they were arrested? They stopped preaching altogether, right? Tom knows. <laughs> they did not. It says they lifted their voice together and they prayed, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and everything in them. Then they go all the way down. And they say, Now look upon the threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hands to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Amen. Come on, church. We need to get radical like the book of Acts. I don't mean stupid and offensive. I mean radical in our pursuit of Jesus. That when, when you are opposed, you don't go, oh, that's it. That's not an open door. You go, oh, maybe I should pray like the apostles prayed. Yeah. Lord, stretch out your hand. Give me boldness. Do signs and wonders through the name of Jesus so that people will see who he is. Are you with me today? We're not just called to be a good people. We're not just called to do good works. We are called to be a sent people empowered through the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel to the nations. I want to share with you three classic Mission myths. And then we're going to land this plane. Thank you for those prophetic words, Jose and Gerald. Love it. Mission myth number one. Preach the word at all times when necessary. Use words. Attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. The problem is he never said it. No biographer says that he said anything close to that, actually. In fact, St. Francis of Assisi believed and founded the order that agreed that teaching and preaching the word of God must be priority. In fact, there's accounts of his life story that he preached in five places in one day. That's the itinerant preacher. And people said, oh yeah, he said preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. What, what that quote is saying is it's misconstruing our actions and our character to be above the proclamation of the word of God. Now, you will find when you read the New Testament, there's a tension between us walking with the character of Christ and proclaiming who he is. These two exist in tension. They can't be separated. We have to know how to do both. But one is not greater than the other. And in fact, as we read in Romans 10, how can someone hear and believe and, and practice the faith unless they've had someone sent? Both are positives in tension. He never said a mission myth number one. You should preach through your actions. No, you preach through your words and your actions. Not one is greater than the other. In fact, if you look at the whole canon of the New Testament, basically all about the proclamation of Scripture and of Jesus. Number two, myth, mission myth. Only the select and called are sent. Only the select and called are sent. Only the pastors, the workers, the missionaries are sent. In fact, you read in the Gospels, you read in the book of Acts, you read of the early church, everyone who follows Jesus, everyone who calls upon his name and is a believer, they become disciples and they are sent. Church, there's not an exclusive group that is sent that you're not a part of. Are you a part of the church today? Do you follow Jesus today? Then you are sent. 
If you've never been told it, I'm sorry that your pastors didn't tell you this, that you are sent on mission with Jesus. There's no part of following Jesus that doesn't include mission. And in fact, sometimes what we do to people is people get radically saved, transformed, healed of addiction, healed of brokenness. We're like, okay, we're going to put you through some classes right now to teach you how to share the gospel. Shut the front door. Just send them out there and let them tell the story of what Jesus did in their life. The best evangelists are the people who have been radically transformed by Jesus. Send them out. Oh, but it'll be messy. They might say something wrong. Of course they're good. Wait, come on. You never said anything wrong in your life about the Bible? Come on. That's another like second 2.1 mission myth is that you have to have all the answers. You don't. Because the Holy Spirit fills your mouth, okay? You have a story. You communicate your story. All believers carry the Spirit. It's not select. In fact, in John 20, verse 21, Jesus entered in to where the disciples were. And here we see the balance of the pastoral and the apostolic in Jesus' ministry. He first says, peace be to you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Here we see in Jesus' life, the pastoral and the prophetic. First he speaks peace. Second, he speaks sending. That's pastoral. That's apostolic. We're all sent. Third myth. Are you with me? Yes sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. My call is to, to pray and support. I'm not called to go. I don't have words to describe this myth. I would need to repent if I... Church, come on, it's Wild Card Weekend in the NFL. How many watch NFL? Somehow we've adopted this mentality that God wants us in the stands while the elite are on the field. I'm called to cheer for you and to hold up a sign and says, go, 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 my favorite sports team. God doesn't want you to be a fan. He wants you on the field. We are all called to pray. We are all called to support. We are all called to go. The Savior didn't die giving his very life for you and I to be spectators on his mission. Whoa, sorry. I'm not sorry. He didn't die for you just to be a spectator. Oh, that's good. Like, I'm coming to church, put in my 35 minutes of singing, maybe give a little toonie there. Yo, I'm helping out. Just watch the prayer. Hear the guy talk. Peace out. Until next month. <laughs> Come on. Yo, I'm here every week. <laughs> I know when you're not, you sit in the same seat, people. Just kidding. It's like my wife's not here. She's working. Everyone knows she's not here. She's working. The Savior didn't die and give his very life for us to be spectators. He calls us to be on the field. We're called to pray and support, but we're called to be out there. But you go, oh, I'm, not, I'm not like that person. Please, do not be like that other person. Do not compare yourself. Jesus didn't put his spirit in you so you would be like someone else. Amen. Okay, listen, there's enough of me. I'm, I'm big personality. There's enough Ikes. There's enough Mikes. There's enough Coach Boykos. Be you. Amen. Empowered by the spirit. Not all of us can be Michelle. Not all of us can be Vanessa. Be you with the spirit of God on you. You're called to be on the field. Being sent means we're called to be contributors not consumers. Are you with me? Contributors, not consumers. You know, I've been at different churches where it literally felt like, like I was coming in to like experience something like a movie or a show. And I didn't like, it wasn't nothing wrong with the church, but it was just the culture of the church was like, I'm coming to see something and I'm coming to leave. And there's no like engagement. And what I love about our church is like, we're already preaching like past normal time but y'all not going to leave right away. Some of you are just going to be milling in the foyer till our second service starts at 2.30. And if you've never been to our second service, you, got, you want to see some worship, man. Shock, how long? Two hours worship, maybe? <laughs> you got to get here. If you've not been here on second service, I tell you, it's something. Being sent means we're called to be contributors, not consumers. We're not just called to be a people who do good works. We're not just to be called to be a good people. We're a sent people with the power of the Holy Spirit bringing the gospel to the nations. I'm going to land this. Matthew 28, one of the most famous passages that we talk about 
known to us generally as Christians, the Great Commission. Jesus says this in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, you're just, just side point. Jesus, again, pastoral and apostolic. He sends them out, and then what does he say that's pastoral? I'm with you to the end of the age. I'm always with you. Here's what he says. He says, I've been given all authority, every bit of authority. And then he doesn't just peace out and go, have a good life. I'm ascending now. See you later. <laughs> He's posing for himself. He doesn't say that. He says, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Go therefore. Does that apply to you? Does it apply to you, church? Amen. Worship team, would you come? Here's the thing. Oftentimes we just get overwhelmed because we go like, my life is too complicated. There's too many things going on. How can I ever be on mission? Jesus doesn't call you to complicate it. He just calls you to be him in every situation you are. Will you fail? 100%. Do I fail? 100%. But he calls you to be him in every situation. How can I do this? I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. Jesus said he would be with you to the very end of the age. When you're on mission, you're not doing it alone. You will never do it alone. Jesus is with you. When you're walking with Jesus, he is there. When you're talking with your coworker and your friends, he is there. When you're talking with your family, those who don't want to hear about Jesus, you have to be wise, but he is there. And right after this passage, we read in Acts 2, where he baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And he poured out and he said, I want to empower you for the mission of God. This is what I want to do. Church, if you think you don't have enough to do the mission, you're right. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. If you think you don't have the words, you're right. None of us do. But that's why he will fill your mouth by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you think you don't have the strength, that's totally right. Because he told us that we need to be strong in his strength. And when we are weak, then we are strong. Worship team, you can begin playing. Church, sometimes when you preach a word like this on mission, people who are, want to get fired up, get fired up. And others feel just like, oh, this is too hard and this is too heavy. How could I ever do this? Let me say this as, as we come into this moment here. That if you will devote your life to focusing your eyes on Jesus. If you will devote your life to spending time in his presence and getting to know the love of Jesus and asking that he clarifies the things you see in here, you will be on mission. Because we can't take the message out to people that is not a living and powerful message if we haven't been with the one who's living and powerful. Are you with me? If we're trying to tell people about Jesus, but we have not been transformed by his presence, it's no use. If we're trying to tell people about the love of God, but we haven't encountered the love of God. We haven't said, Jesus, would you be everything to me? Open my eyes, open my ears, let me hear and see you. We won't ever carry the mission. Church, would you stand with me? Today in this moment, if you have felt the Spirit of God through the Word of God moving you to say yes to his mission, I want you to put your hands up to him right now. And Lord, in this moment, we pray every bit of empowerment, every bit of knowledge, every bit of grace and words would come to us by the power of the Spirit. Lord, that we would sense afresh again your commissioning. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Go therefore, make disciples. Make disciples of young and old. Make disciples of the students in your classes, the co-workers in cubicles beside you. Make disciples of the people who serve you coffee and food and restaurants. Make disciples of those around you in your family. Jesus, we want to have our eyes so fixed on you that you literally are our vision, all we see, and we cannot help but tell of the things that we have seen and heard. 
Lord, come with a radical empowerment by your spirit so that we will be radical, Lord, like the believers in Acts. Lord, you give us wisdom so that we're not putting our foot in our mouth and saying just ridiculous things that cause offense, but we're saying wise things that draw people to you. Lord, give us Holy Spirit strategies to bring your hope and your purpose to those far from you. In Jesus' name. Let's worship. Thank you for listening to Hope Unveiled. If you're interested in learning more about what you heard today, or if you would like us to pray for something specific for you, we invite you to connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca.